Hello, welcome to some more lectures about physics. This is on chapter 9 about condensed matter physics. As I mentioned, I think in the last chapter's lectures, we're really getting to a point where the mathematics involved in all this physics is just beyond this course. So this chapter, there's going to be a lot of storytelling, if you will. It's going to kind of paint the picture for you, give you an idea of how the mechanics of these different things work out, and we'll learn about some very interesting stuff. So the condensed part here generally is talking about solids and liquids, having to do with chemical bonds. And these are just some examples of what would be considered condensed matter. There's a crystal, quartz crystal, and the path we're going to take in this chapter is first we're going to talk about the chemical bonds themselves, kinds of bonds, and relate that back to our understanding from Schrodinger's equation and orbitals. From there we'll kind of get towards particular kinds of condensed matter, namely crystalline solids or crystals, not necessarily amorphic crystals, but uh, lattice structured crystals, so very evenly spaced structures. And that will get us to an understanding then of a particular kind of crystalline solid, a metal, which then kind of allows us to understand some very interesting stuff from what you would call solid state physics. Things like diodes and transistors and all this stuff that underlies our modern day life. So like this image here is a processor, the inside of like the little integrated circuit chips. So our understanding of condensed matter really allowed us to take larger circuits that you might have seen with resistors and capacitors and inductors and then we get in these new things, transistors, and diodes, and all that kind of good stuff. And beyond just being those new things, our understanding of this stuff allows us to shrink down all of those components incredibly tiny. So there's like billions upon billions of components on this uh, processor, and the chip is maybe that big. Okay, so chemical bonds. Firstly, these strong chemical bonds, particularly what's known as a covalent bond. So co isn't kind of like a partnering thing. The covalent bond is when two atoms share electrons, and roughly sort of evenly share those electrons. Atoms form molecules. So the simplest example you can think of is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest atom there is, and so it lends itself well to understanding some of these things. But if you imagine, you know, you have two hydrogen atoms, they both each have one electron, and separately, each of those electrons is in the 1s uh, orbital, one of state, and remember within that state, those electrons could be spin up or spin down. Right? That's that last quantum number that we learned about, that spin state. And if you imagine taking those two hydrogen atoms and you put them closer and closer together, then the images here are showing that kind of action of coming closer and closer together. Instead of showing the hydrogen atom as just a sphere, we get a better picture of it as actually this like electron cloud, probability cloud around it, and basically the clouds just start to overlap. And when they overlap, as long as one of those electrons ends up as a spin down and one as a spin up, then there's sort of space around both of those hydrogen atoms to accommodate a spin up and a spin down electron. So they're able to actually pair together. You could also think about it as like when they get closer together, the electrons end up sort of spending a bit more time in between the protons. And so the protons that are at the nucleus of these hydrogen atoms see this negative area in between them and are actually attracted to that negative area. So they end up getting pulled towards each other. Even though they're both positively charged, there's this overall net negative area in between them, so they get pulled together. Yeah, so H2 is a nice example for covalent bonds, and it'll come back probably a number of times over the chapter here. The other kind of strong chemical bond, I'll say a little bit more about strong versus weak quantitatively in just a minute, but for now. The other strong chemical bond is known as an ionic bond. And ion meaning a charged atom. So what ends up happening in these bonds is that an electron is almost exchanged, or one electron will go from one to the other, and so you'll end up with two electrically charged atoms, oppositely charged atoms, so that opposite charge kind of pulls them together. In fact, the ionic bond can really be thought of as kind of the extreme case of a covalent bond, where the electron actually is still shared between the atoms here, that extra electron that's going to go back and forth. It's just in an ionic bond, that sharing is incredibly lopsided. So all the way down at the bottom here is showing basically the probability distribution of finding that electron that's being shared between the sodium and the chloride. 
So an electron ends up moving from the sodium to the chlorine, basically, but there's still a probability that you find it around the sodium. It's just much more likely that it's going to be around the chlorine. So essentially the chlorine kind of took it away, or it was given by the sodium to the chlorine. And you can understand that from our knowledge of electron configurations and orbitals. Right? In the bottom left there, we're seeing the electron configuration for the sodium and the chlorine. Sorry, I think together they're known as sodium chloride, but Cl is chlorine by itself. So I might get those mixed up. Sorry. Anyway, looking at those electron configurations, we can see in the outermost shell in sodium, that outermost shell, the valence shell, only has one electron. But there's room for eight electrons in that outer shell. And in a little bit more detail, it turns out that that outer shell electron is actually generally in this sort of spherical kind of shell, or maybe donut shaped kind of shell around the sodium the nucleus. And basically the other electrons that make up that sodium atom kind of form a negative cloud around the sodium nucleus. And so that very outer electron sees a much smaller charge that's pulling it to the nucleus, right? Because it's sort of the net of the charge of the nucleus minus that electron cloud that's in the lower orbital states. So this outer electron in sodium is pretty weakly bound. On the other hand, in chlorine, it actually has seven electrons in its outermost shell, in its valence shell, and it can have up to eight, and so it really kind of wants that last eight one. Right? It'll really balance it out nicely if we could just fill up that last shell. Yeah, and so there's a lot of ways to think about it, but like in the top here we see just looking at the valence shell of these atoms, that sodium atom ends up kind of giving off its electron to the chlorine. Sodium ends up being positively charged, the chlorine ends up being negatively charged, and so that kind of attracts them together electrically. And also just to mention that this sodium chloride molecule is another nice one and very nice example of ionic bond, and so I think it might come back again off as well. Okay, so how do we understand in a little more detail why atoms will end up bonding together? This is about two hydrogen atoms again. When you bring the two hydrogen atoms together, there's sort of this back and forth for these two overlapping potentials that are trying to impose themselves. There's a repulsive potential between them, which is, you know, the electrons repulsing the electrons, the protons repulsing the protons. There's that kind of repulsive potential energy that you would end up with in the upper left there. But there's also an attractive one, right? The proton attracting the electron, the electron attracting the proton. And so there's an attractive potential overall too. The net effect is the kind of the sum of those, and what we end up with is a potential energy diagram that looks like this. At very close distances, the potential goes up to infinity, basically, drops down, and there's this kind of potential well. And then at larger and larger distances, it ends up going back up and kind of flattening out. They both flatten out at further and further distances. So think about it in terms of like regions where the attraction or repulsion is happening at very, very large distances relative to the size of the atom, of course. There's very little force between them, and there's nothing going on, right? They're just atoms very far away, they're basically not interacting. Bring them closer together, though, you get sort of this middle region where the potential starts to drop down, and that's going to be a region where there's attraction. The potential is going down in a negative way, and so it's actually going to form to pull these atoms together. And then at some point, you get into this very small distance region where the atoms are very close together, and then the repulsion starts to pick back up again. So that's where you get this dip and it jumps back up. So thinking back to what I was saying about the electrons kind of getting in between the protons and end up attracting each of them together, if you start squeezing the protons together more and more and more, when you get past the bottom of this potential well, you can kind of think about that as now squeezing the electrons out of that region in between them, and now it's like a proton seeing a proton. They're both positively charged and they start to push each other apart. One other way of thinking about that repulsion actually too though is when you really start to overlap those hydrogen atoms, the electrons want to get into the same orbital, but you can't have two electrons with the same quantum state. And so there's this repulsion that you can kind of think of as due to Pauli's exclusion principle. Two electrons can't occupy the exact same state. And looking at this diagram, there's a couple of key things. For one, there's what's known as the bond length, which is that bottom of the potential well. So once the atoms get close enough together, the stable state ends up being right there at the bottom of the potential well. Kind of the most likely distance these atoms are going to end up being apart from each other, what we call the bond length. And then the height or the depth almost of that potential well, right, from like here to here, that's what we sometimes call the binding energy. 
It's also known as the disassociation energy, and that's because if you do have these two particles, these two atoms that are together at the, kind of the bottom of this potential well, you need to give it that much energy in order to bring them back out of the potential well and then, until there's no force between them. So this is binding energy, it's the dissociation energy, and there might be one more term for it. Oh yeah, also called bond energy. And these are just some examples of molecules and their dissociation energy, right, the depth of that potential well, and the equilibrium separation, the bond length. So bond lengths typically tenths of nanometers or you know hundreds of picometers. And the dissociation energy, anywhere from four, five electron volts down to one half electron volts. Oh, I guess there's one all the way. Neon's a very strong bond that's almost 10 electron volts. So this is just a little bit more about kind of complications that can come in or more complicated potential energy diagrams that you end up with or just potential energy situations in general when you're talking about binding atoms and molecules. You don't have to worry too much about it, but it's an interesting thing to know that there can be not just a potential well, but a lot of bonds actually end up having this sort of hill as well before it kind of drops back down. So that hill is sometimes known, or at least the height of that hill is known as the activation energy. The reason being is that when you have atoms that are very far apart, right, R is very large, and you want to bring them together, you actually have to give those atoms energy, or at least one of them, enough energy to put it over that hill, that activation energy height, before it can then drop down to the potential well, and then they're stable. But you actually have to give it more energy to get them put together like that. But sort of like activating the bond, maybe in a way. And even more interesting is when bonds have binding energies that are positive, right? So the height of that well here is actually above the sort of equilibrium energy, or like where the potential bottoms out all the way out here. So since that energy is above that, if you are able to bind these atoms together, or make this molecule happen, you have to get over the activation energy height, and then it drops down to the potential well, but it's not back down to where it started, or it's not below where it started either, all the way at this zero, kind of all the way out here, it's above that, right? Meaning that that height, whatever that is, that's energy that's storing in this bond. And then if you give it a little bit of energy to get it back over the activation height here, then you get that energy back. An example of this is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is sometimes called like the power cell of our cells, and it's how our cells store energy and then release it when we need to do something. So the difference between these two would be adenosine triphosphate is a single molecule, but when you separate it, you get adenosine diphosphate and an extra phosphorus. So that was the strong chemical bonds, covalent and the ionic bonds. What about weak chemical bonds? So when you talk about weak chemical bonds, they're often called the van der Waals bonds, or van der Waals, due to van der Waals forces. And these bonds come about through uh, electrical attraction, through a Coulomb force, but there's no sharing of electrons. I mean, each of the atoms keeps its own electron by itself. It just turns out that one of the atoms maybe has like a dipole, and so it ends up like inducing a dipole in another atom and then they're attracted to each other or maybe both atoms are polar and they both have dipoles and they can uh, flip around and to, until they kind of line up their pluses and their minuses and attract each other. One example shown here is that like spontaneous uh, dipole that might happen so even if you have an atom that's neutral and doesn't have an intrinsic dipole like helium just because the where the electron is and the shape of the atom is just kind of random and things can change around. Uh, the charge distribution, for whatever reason, well, for no reason at all, just randomly will end up being like a little bit more negative on one side, a little more positive on the other side. And there you have a dipole. If another helium atom is near that dipole, then it'll feel that electric field from the dipole and will induce a, a dipole of its own. And then you have a positive end of this first helium atom lining up the negative end of the second helium atom, and there you go, they attract each other. That's one kind of weak bond that can happen. Weak bonds that involve hydrogen are particularly important for life in general, I guess. <laughs> I'm not a chemist or a biologist, but they are very important. They're called hydrogen bonds, but hydrogen bonds is a kind of Van der Waals bond or a kind of weak chemical bond.
And also to point out now the energies that we're talking about, how much binding energy are we talking about for each of these bonds? In terms of the strong ones, right, the covalent and the ionic, that's a few electron volts, two to five electron volts, somewhere around there. The weak chemical bonds is hundreds to tenths of electron volts, something like 10 to 100 times less than the strong bonds. It's also interesting to keep in mind how these binding energies relate to temperature, or if you think about them in terms of like what temperature would that be, you have to think back to your thermodynamics, but the energy associated with the temperature is essentially just Boltzmann's constant, Kb, multiplied by that temperature, and you get an energy. And so whatever that temperature is, that's the temperature associated with that energy. So for something like a few electron volts, that associated temperature is like 10,000 Kelvin versus the weak bonds, those are like uh, maybe 100 to 1,000 Kelvin. We're not going to worry too much about this hybridization stuff, but it's an interesting topic, so I just wanted to at least say one thing about it. The idea here is that when atoms make bonds, sometimes the configuration of the electrons in that like first atom, say like the carbon here, will reorganize themselves in a way. And so they don't just have the standard orbitals that you would expect from just applying Schrodinger's equation normally, because there's this other kind of atom coming in and it adjusts its orbitals. Carbon normally has the 1s shell filled, the 2 shell, n equals 2 shell, has these subshells s and p, so the s shell is filled, it's still a spherical sheet, but there's only two atoms in the p shells and so they occupy part of these sort of dumbbells and you can have six electrons in these 2p orbitals altogether. But if that carbon is around hydrogen then it wants to bond with this hydrogen because it wants to fill up the rest of those shells in a sense. And so it sort of reorganizes itself in a way to form this tetrahedral shape. And now it ends up having these four positions that can overlap with the hydrogen and can bond with the hydrogen. So this morphing of configuration is called hybridization. Instead of one 2s subshell and then these three 2p shells you end up with four, what you call it, sp3 orbitals. And that's how we form CH4 methane. Yeah, and in the picture at the very bottom, those spheres are the hydrogen. It's a 1s orbital state for hydrogen. There's four positions for them now to come in and bond to this hybridized carbon. Okay, so now we've got some ideas about how the bonds work. And now we can just kind of imagine, okay, we have bonded atoms, we have molecules. Are these polyatomic atoms you call molecules. And now that we do have those, we have to now consider the new sort of degrees of freedom or ability to move in different ways that these molecules now have. And that means that there's different energies that they can have and that's gonna affect the overall energy states that are available to the electrons that are in these molecules. So we're gonna talk about some new energy states, vibrational and rotational states, now, when we refer back to the kind of older states where it was just like the principal quantum number and the orbital angular momentum quantum number, those were able to change. Those states we're gonna to refer to as the electronic states. But here, we're looking at some vibrations. On the left, there's two examples shown. One is a diatonic molecule that's vibrating in and out. That's one way of vibrating, right? That might be uh, H2, it might be two hydrogens that bond together and they're vibrating. Another kind of vibration is shown below that for water, H2O, a triatomic molecule. So the oxygen is fairly stationary, it's much bigger than the hydrogen, and the hydrogens are kind of vibrating back and forth. So just examples of kinds of vibrations that can happen now that we have these more complicated objects, molecules. And like I said, that's going to affect the energy states that are possible. So before, we just had, say, like a S2 and a P3 electronic state. Right, having to do with the n and p values. But now each of those states is going to be split into substates because each of those states can now vibrate in different ways. Right? It's not just the n and the l that can change. They're actually, these vibrational states are possible for each of them too. So you end up going from just a single electronic state to many vibrational states within one electronic state. So how do we deal with vibrational energies? Well, Turns out we can really well approximate 
kind of the ladder of those vibrational energies, like the split, and what possible energies there can be, just by going back to our nice, simple harmonic oscillator potential, right? one half k x squared. And if you think about it in terms of a vibration, it doesn't really have a spring necessarily involved, but the frequency of that vibration is related to that k, that spring constant, and mu, which is the reduced mass. We have two masses, m1 and m2, the reduced mass looks like that. It might make a little more sense now why we spent some time thinking about the solution to Schrodinger's equation for this simple harmonic oscillator potential. So thinking back, the energy levels that come out from Schrodinger's equation with this potential are some integer plus one half times h times the frequency, remember h is Planck's constant. And if recall that this integer, we're using mu here, it looks like a v, technically it's a Greek letter mu, could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, anything else. Keep going up. Um, the book, I believe, actually still uses n for this integer, which is kind of frustrating. So we're going to be using this to be or mu, or at least i am here. And also thinking about the difference in energy between these energy states, we end up just with hf. And in terms of the kind of transitions that can happen for vibrational transitions, we're going to have these selection rules, which like the allowed transitions, sort of like we talked about with the allowed orbital angular momentum transitions. I mean, it's essentially the same thing. Selection rule here is actually the same as with that orbital angular momentum. It's that the vibrational quantum number can change by plus or minus one. And also to note here that the vibrational energy transitions are typically on the order of the tenth of an electron volt. And that corresponds to a temperature of about a thousand Kelvin. You may or may not be thinking that it's a little bit odd we can just use this simple harmonic oscillator potential because the overall potential of the bond is more complicated than just that. There's more going on. However, it turns out it's a very good approximation here because the places where you get these vibrational states are essentially at the bottom of those potential wells. Let's remember if you make this bond, generally you end up with this sort of, at some point in the potential energy diagram, there's this potential well. And if you think about the shape of that potential well, near the bottom, it's just kind of like cup, or basically like a parabola. So if we're looking at the states that are possible within that overall energy state, then they do kind of act basically just like a simple harmonic oscillator potential, mostly just the fact that they go as x squared, or the separation distance squared. Okay, so that's vibrational states. I also mentioned rotational states. So now again, we have these complex molecules. They have these new sort of freedoms and that they can rotate about different axes. And then that rotation has its own energy associated with it. So again, we're getting more energy states because these atoms and molecules can now rotate. Here's some examples. On the left, it looks like a triatomic molecule, so maybe H2O. And showing one example of a kind of rotation is like rotating about an axis through the central atom. And on the right here, we're looking at a rotation of like a diatomic molecule, so maybe H2, N2, O2. It's also showing like slightly where we're going to in that these molecules, it's not just that they vibrate or that they rotate. They're actually doing both of them at the same time. So you sort of have this molecule that's rotating, but it's also oscillating as it does that. So then if you think about what is the energy associated with rotation, well, you got to go all the way back to when you thought about rotational motion, and it turns out that that energy goes like the square of the angular velocity, tend to be the moment of inertia multiplied by the square of the angular velocity, one half of that. And we can write that a little bit differently as i omega squared over 2i by multiplying by i over i, and we'll see in a second why we do that. That is because i omega is the angular momentum of a rotating object. And hopefully you recall angular momentum, we went through a lot of stuff with angular momentum in the last chapter, the chapter before, but angular momentum at the quantum level is quantized. And that quantization looks like square root of again, some integer multiplied by itself plus one, all that multiplied by h bar, and this integer now can go from zero to any positive value. Putting that stuff together, the energy associated with rotation of a molecule 
looks like that integer L, we're calling L, that integer multiplied by that integer plus 1, multiplied by h bar squared over 2i. Then thinking about the difference in those states, going from like L equals 0 to L equals 1, L equals 1 to L equals 2, that difference actually depends on L, but it's h bar squared over the moment of inertia of the molecule, multiplied by L. And again, we have this selection rule for these rotational states in that this L value needs to change by plus or minus 1. And the last thing to note is the energy associated with these rotational transitions is on the order of a hundredth of an electron volt. And in terms of temperature, that's like hundreds of Kelvin. If you remember your Kelvin scale, that's like room temperature, meaning that rotational states of molecules are very easily and readily excitable by just being in a room temperature environment. Now, put all of those transitions together, the electronic transitions, right, for principal quantum number, orbital and momentum quantum number, those uh, 1s, 2s, 2p, right, transitions between those states are the electronic states, and now we're adding in this vibrational states and the rotational states. It can get complicated, but think about the energy of these different states. The energy of the electronic state generally looks like this sort of potential well, right, it goes drops down, comes back up, and kind of bottoms out, or flattens out. And within any given electronic state, we now have these vibrational states. So those are just these energy levels within there. And the rotational levels are even smaller than that. And so within each of these vibrational states, there are now smaller states even that are the rotational states. Looking at, say, the ground state, it now has these vibrational states, and each one of those has a rotational state, or multiple rotational states. And then you think about the excited state, so going from like a 1s state to like a 2s state or something, then 2s also now has these vibrational states within there, there are rotational states. If you draw them just sort of vertically, then it kind of looks more like this, where they're showing maybe the 2s electronic state, and within there, there are these two different vibrational states, each one of those chunks is the vibrational states, and then within those, are multiple rotational states. So up here, like the 3p electronic state has these vibrational states within, and then within those again are rotational states. And the arrows on this diagram here are showing some allowed transitions. Right? So looking at, say, the furthest to the right red arrow, it looks like it's going between the 2s electronic state and the 3p electronic state. So this is an electronic transition fairly large energy difference. But besides that, we're going from the first vibrational state, that mu equals one in S2, or 2S, to the zeroth vibrational state in the 3P electronic state. So going here. And then within that, the rotational state, it looks like it's going from L equals four to L equals three. So that's good, that follows all of our selection rules. The vibrational state changed from 1 to 0, so it changed 1. The rotational state changed from 4 to 3. Again, yeah, change of 1, plus or minus 1. So those red arrows are showing allowed states, or allowed transitions. The black arrows with little x's on them are showing some forbidden transitions. So the longer black arrow, you're going from one vibrational state to another, so u is changing by 1, that's fine. But the rotational state is 3, up here, it's also 3 down here. So the change in L was 0 there, so not good. It doesn't follow our selection rules. But you can kind of see, now we don't just have the you know 1s to 2s transition, or 2s to 3p, or some kind of transition like that. There's all these other states within there, due to the vibrations, to the rotations. There's a lot more going on. Molecules are complicated. Taking a little bit more look at a transition, that say rotational and vibrational. And in fact, our selection rules imply that if you make a vibrational transition, you also have to make a rotational transition. In A there, kind of zoomed in on that diagram from before, where we're just looking at two vibrational states and the rotational states within those. On that diagram, ignore all the bottom arrows, just thinking about the two red arrows so they're each going from the vibrational state 0 to 1, or 1 to 0, 
one of them is going from rotational state four to three. So that's good, right? That's changing L of one, so fine. The other one is going from L equals two to L equals three. Again, a change of one. So both of those are good transitions there. If you think about all the possibilities for a transition from one vibrational state to another, then it turns out that that transition from one vibrational state to the other with the same rotational energy is forbidden, right? That rotational state three to three is no good. So that transition is forbidden for vibrational things. So that's why right in the middle here on this top diagram, a transition with energy HF is actually forbidden. That's the energy associated with the change in vibrational state. What is allowed though, is these vibrational changes that also involve a change in the rotational state. So if a vibrational transition happens and a rotational change goes from say zero to one, that's fine. Both of them change by one, they're good. And that's associated with this first line on the right there, or just to the right of HF. Or if the vibrational state changes by one and the rotational state changes from one to two, also good, right? That's the second line there. And on the other side is if the rotational states are decreasing from one to zero or from two to one. So that's sort of like a diagram or a depiction of that. This is closer to actual data that you would get if you looked at the absorption spectrum of a molecule. Right in the center, that's where the solely vibrational transition would be, but it's not possible. You need to also have this rotational transition happen. So that's why it has these peaks around the side. This is kind of complicated stuff. Like I don't really expect that you're gonna necessarily take this in right now, but it is quite interesting. So just wanted to show you guys. So the vibrational rotational energy states, very interesting stuff. We're kind of moving on from that to thinking about now, instead of just single bonds, building up larger structures, larger materials, macroscopic things with many, many bonds or them all together, you get things like solids. We're thinking specifically about crystalline solids, which, like I said earlier, they form into these nice regular structures, these lattices. There's also amorphous solids, which are sort of just like randomly put together. But we're going to concern ourselves with the lattice structures. Some examples are shown on the left there, kind of the simple cube for A, B, which known as the face-centered cube, where you have atoms on the faces of each of the cube, or C, we have this body-centered cube, where there's this atom right in the center of the cube, and not the faces. And then to build up a larger structure, there's just many, many, many of these cubic structures next to each other. Right? And so the ones on the outside partake in sort of like this one, but they also partake in the neighboring one. Then the atoms on the far side of that one partake in the bonds to the next ones over, and build up these bigger structures, these lattices. So bringing back to sodium chloride, this is sort of what the structure looks like. It's a face-centered cube where the chloride atoms and the chloride ions are on the faces of each of the cube. We're going to think more about this one. Particularly, what is the potential energy associated with any of the atoms in this structure, in this crystalline structure? To put it mildly, it's complicated. So we're just going to understand a little bit and it's going to give you some of the results. So let's just think about the sodium ion in the very center of this cube. The atoms or the ions that are nearest to this sodium one are the ones that are on the faces of each of the cube. So there's a chlorine atom. It's just like on the front face. It could be a little cube here, like on face one, right in the middle of that, there's that chlorine atom or chloride ion. That's one of the ones that's closest to that sodium ion, and then there's also the chlorine ion on the back face of the cube, and on all faces of the cube, left, right, top, bottom, those are all the things that are closest to it. And the sodium ion is positively charged, the chlorine ion is negatively charged due to the sharing or the kind of the giving of electrons to the, from the sodium to the chloride, meaning that that central sodium ion is sort of attracted to all of those chlorine ions, and there's six of them. Right, one on each face of the cube. The next nearest atoms to that central sodium ion are more sodium ions that have the same charge, so they're repulsive. But if you look, there's a sodium ion at the middle of each edge of the cube. Right, so there's one like on that, right between the face one and two, right in the middle of that edge, there's a sodium ion there. And there's ones on all these edges, 
There's in fact 12 of those, and again, they're repulsive because they have the same charge as the sodium ion in the center. In summary, the potential that that central sodium ion experiences is due to all of these other atoms. In fact, in a solid, it's due to the potential from all the atoms in that solid. So overall, it's a coulomb potential of some kind, and you're sort of adding and subtracting positive and negative, or repulsively attractive ones at different distances. It can be quite complicated, but it really comes down to just being a coulomb potential with some constant in front, which you write as alpha. And alpha will depend on the structure of the crystal itself. For sodium chloride, alpha is about 1.75. Yeah, alpha is in fact this sort of slowly converging series of values based on the geometry of the structure. It's not actually an infinite series, because it depends on the amount of atoms in this solid. But if you're talking about atoms in a solid, it's like 10 to the 24th atoms. So it's a very, very long series. So that's thinking about the Coulomb potential. There's also, though, this sort of potential that we think about as associated with the Pauli exclusion principle. Like I said earlier, you bring these atoms too close together, then the electrons in their orbitals start to overlap, and they end up almost wanting to be in the same state as each other. But the Pauli exclusion principle says that that can't happen. So there ends up being this sort of repulsive potential that we associate with the Pauli exclusion principle. Again, it's very complicated. I believe it comes down to a lot of statistical analysis, enumerating states and things like that. But nicely enough, it can be written pretty simply as some constant over r, the distance between these atoms, to uh, integer power n. And it's unfortunate a lot of the same variables are used. n is not the principal quantum number that we remember from before. It is just an integer, and it depends on the kind of bond in that solid. For sodium chloride, n is 8. Uh, don't ask me why. I don't know why. So if you combine the Coulomb potential we looked at before, and this Pauli exclusion potential, we end up with something that looks like that. And you can figure out what A is by looking at the bond length, the minimum of the potential well. And it turns out that the combined potential can be written like the bottom here, where R0 is that bond length, or the equilibrium distance between atoms in this solid. And you should also keep in mind that when we're talking about putting all these atoms together in a solid, it's no longer just like the sodium and the chloride that we put together before. Those were two things by themselves, and they had a particular bond length associated with them. When you put them all together into a larger solid, there's more things happening. So the, that equilibrium separation, that bond length, is not quite the same anymore. It's close, but it's not, it's not exactly the same. And this is just a diagram showing the result of combining these two potentials we still end up with this familiar kind of uh, potential well, drops down, comes back up, and evens out. So that sodium chloride is an example of an ionic bond forming solid, forming crystalline structure. You also have covalent bonds that will form crystalline structures. One example is diamond. The exact structure of the lattice is a bit different than the other ones we looked at. This carbon will inform these sort of tetrahedral shapes. But that, just to show you that, that these covalent bonded crystals do occur as well. And like I said, talking about bonds kind of got us to talk about thinking about solids. And now a particular kind of solid, uh, metal. It's a very useful solid. So in order to understand metals, and also in a way we'll understand why a metal is like a conductive material versus other materials that are more like insulators, a metal is a particular kind of solid where the electrons, the outermost electrons for each of the atoms in the crystal, are very loosely bound to their nuclei. So what you end up with in like a macroscopic piece of metal, like a chunk of metal, all of the outer electrons from the, for the atoms that make up that metal are just sort of free to roam around the entire material, the entire piece of metal. And what are left then are slightly positive uh, ions that make up the structure. So this is known as the free electron model or free electron theory because the outer electrons are kind of free to just roam around. This sort of state of electrons flowing around like this is also sometimes referred to as an electron gas. So there's all these electrons just flowing around this material, but our understanding of solids comes along with this idea of energy levels and the energies that each of these electrons can have, the energy states that each of these electrons can occupy. So what are the energetic states 
of these free electrons, this electron gas. Well, you can get at what the states are or what the energy of those states are by essentially treating a macroscopic piece of metal as like a three-dimensional square well or the particle in a box. Recall we looked at this particle in a box where there was an electron in a box or a particle in a box and it could move freely within the box but there is an infinite potential outside so it couldn't get out, out of the box. If you apply that idea in three dimensions to a piece of metal then you can get the energy states of the free electrons in that metal. Remember when we're talking about the electrons here, the free electrons, those are only the ones that are the outermost electrons for the metal. The metal atoms themselves still have a lot of electrons generally, but they're all stuck to that particular atom. There's just like a one or two of their outer electrons or a few of their outer electrons that end up being able to roam freely around. So when we're applying our understanding of quantum mechanics and using Schrodinger's equation, we're applying it to those free electrons. So applying that to the three-dimensional particle in a box, we end up getting the energies available or the energies that these free electrons can have just looks like it did before for the one-dimensional square well, except where we have an index sort of associated with each dimension or each direction. So if you look back or think back to the particle in a box, the energy for each state looks just like that. Pi squared, h bar squared over 2m mass of the electron multiplied by L, the length of that box, or the width of that box squared. And then it was multiplied by n squared. Here we have three dimensions, and so we now essentially have three different indexes that can change. However, the overall situation is a little bit different now, because when we did the particle in a box, we were just thinking about one electron in that box. Right? And so it could occupy any of these energy levels that we ended up getting. It could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever we want to. Here, these are the energy states available for all of the free electrons in this metal. So in, say, the lowest energy state, when n1, n2, n3, when those equal 1, that's one energy state, that's the lowest energy state, there could be one electron. There technically would be two electrons in that state because they could be spin up and spin down. But that's it. Once the electrons are in there, that state's built, and you can't have any more electrons with that energy. That means that the next states, or the next electrons you imagine, have to fill the next highest energy state, and then the next highest one, and then the next highest one. And so when you think about the electrons, all of these free electrons in this metal, they're essentially filling up all these energy states for the macroscopic piece of metal. Can you think about this sort of filling up the energy states in this metal? Right? We're filling them up with the free electrons. Sort of like filling up a glass. When you start filling the glass, you're filling up the lowest level, right, the lowest energy level, and you just kind of keep filling it up, right? Once the lowest energy is filled, you can't put more in there, so they just sort of stack on top of each other, filling up higher and higher energy levels. Eventually, until that's all the electrons that are in the metal, right? these free electrons are just there in the metal, we're just kind of imagining putting them into these energy states, or filling up these energy states. Once you run out of electrons, you're at the highest energy level associated with that metal. That's what we call the Fermi energy, or Fermi, in exactly how I pronounce it. I think it was Italian. For a piece of metal, the Fermi energy can be calculated this way. I think N and V are just like the number of electrons and the volume of the metal. 